Welcome to the Therapy and Prayer Podcast. Here you'll find the intersection between faith and mental health. I'm your host, Camille. I'm a licensed therapist and clinical social worker, but more importantly, I'm a Christian who really loves the Lord. And I'm just trying to navigate this life without falling victim to it, just like everyone else. Here we take a faith-based approach to all things mental health and wellness, because the Bible tells us to guard our heart and mind. And sometimes we need a little bit of help with that. Hey everyone, welcome or welcome back to the Therapy and Prayer Podcast. My name is Camille and per usual, I am so, so happy that you're here. Happy Wednesday, happy hump day. You made it halfway through the week. So uh, give yourself a little pat on the back just because you made it here and you, you deserve it. Uh, I hope you all are doing well and that you have been enjoying uh, these episodes so far. Um, I really feel like I'm kind of getting in, into my groove here with these things. So thanks for thanks for sticking with me. Today, we are going to get into another topic that uh, I have been trying to walk through and heal through lately, uh, which tells me that there are probably lots of other people who have been trying to walk through and heal through this. Um, and that is this whole idea of uh, self-control, self-discipline. And specifically how impulsivity plays a role in that. So it's kind of a, a amalgamation like impulsivity, procrastination, motivation, self-control. We're talking about <laughs> all of those things today. We'll see what the actual title ends up being, but that's where we're going to spend our time today. So as y'all know, as I've said before, I have struggled with procrastination for years and years. And for the past couple of years, I have really been trying to work on it and work through it. And for me, a big part of working through something is getting to the root of it. In doing so, I found that part of the reason that I have a procrastination issue is because I actually have a self-discipline issue. So of course, once I realized that, this led me down a whole other rabbit hole of trying to understand why I struggle with with self-discipline uh, and more importantly, like how how do I fix it? This is kind of the analytical approach that I take to a lot of things in my life. Um, I try my best to understand it to the best of my ability, but I think sometimes it gets to a certain point where it's beyond my own understanding and that's where my faith has to come in to say, you know what? Your thoughts are above my thoughts, uh, and I'm not supposed to be leaning on my own understanding anyway. But uh, my own kind of analysis and understanding has helped me to to see things in a different way. Um, and if nothing else, it has reframed uh, self discipline for me, and has made it uh, more more of a priority, and has made me feel more motivated in it. So we're, we're I'm getting ahead of myself again, per usual. We're gonna get there. But I feel like every year for the past like three or four years, I've declared it like this is the year that I'm finally going to overcome my procrastination. This is the year that I'm going to beat the procrastination. But a part of the reframe that I found, and especially once I realized procrastination isn't the real culprit here, it's the self-control and the self-discipline, I have reframed that declaration to saying, you know, this is when I'm finally going to master self-discipline. And that reframe in itself has been helpful for me. I think it's sometimes easier to add something than to take something away. Because if you remove something, you have to replace it with something else anyway. Um, and so by saying, oh, I'm going to finally get rid of the procrastination, well, what am I going to have instead then? So instead of focusing on the procrastination, I'm wanting to focus on uh, on the, the self-discipline. So that's kind of where I am with it now. But there's a lot of stuff in between there that we're going to talk about too. So typically, when we talk about procrastination, we talk about it in terms of our avoidance and our anxiety. But what we don't often hear is the role of impulsivity in procrastination. But in analyzing my own habits, I've, I've really learned the role of impulsivity in all of it. When we say the term impulsivity, we often think of people doing like wild, wild and crazy things that don't make sense and... Um, and, and we think of it as more active and more expressive, but all impulsive really means is that we are acting without thinking and that we're doing things based off of a feeling, a momentary feeling. And that shows up in our avoidance because we are moved by fear and we're moved by a feeling. We're trying to avoid a certain feeling. We're trying to avoid a certain fear. And so when uh, we make a different decision, let me speak for myself. When I make a different decision, instead of doing the thing that I'm supposed to be doing, I'm typically moved by a negative emotional experience and I'm allowing that to make the decision for me in the moment. So based on that definition, impulsivity is a big part of my own procrastination. 
for me, I get easily overwhelmed, overstimulated. According to my sister, I'm like easily frazzled (laughs) sometimes by day-to-day things, especially if there's like a really long to-do list or I have some like complex or or, um, compounded responsibilities and things that I have to do. I get pretty overwhelmed uh, and I go towards avoidance pretty quickly. So instead of just starting the task, I will find something else to do, something that that probably would feel better to do in the moment. Even if it, it, it's like a, a menial thing, but um, I'll, I'll find something to do like, oh, you know what? Let me go and check the mail because I haven't checked the mail in however long. Um, but like, girl, the mail can wait. Anyway, I'll find something else to do, which means that the to-do list just keeps getting longer. And then I just get even more overwhelmed and I just put it off more and more and more. But all of that is controlled by the momentary feeling that I am experiencing. And so in that moment, I'm allowing my anxiety or my fear to make the decision for me. I am acting off of an impulse rather than off of logic. Remember that avoidance is a defense mechanism and all defense mechanisms are fear-based. So in that moment, I'm I'm acting on a fearful instinct, right? My fight or flight is kicking in. And it's interesting using the terminology fight or flight when I'm talking about day-to-day things. Like I've got a pile of clean laundry that hasn't been folded. That's not a good example. I don't think that I'm anxious or scared about folding my laundry, but we're talking about like day-to-day things and When we say like fight or flight, we typically think of like trauma response, Um, but it comes up a lot in these things, right? Or like I'm waiting, waited until the last moment to do my taxes because my taxes actually have been pretty traumatizing for me over the last couple of years. So I'm waiting until the last moment to do these things because um, I am uh, nervous or fearful of what the end result is going to be. I'm always concerned that I'm doing them wrong or that I'm missing something. I still feel um, inadequate or unprepared to be like a successful business owner. So I'm avoiding it. Right. So in that sense, it really is my anxiety and my fear, my fight or flight that's showing up in that moment. And so instead of doing my taxes, um, I am going to work on this craft that has been sitting here for so long, or instead of doing my taxes, I'm going to try a new recipe, or instead of doing my taxes, I'm going to sit on the couch and (laughs) do nothing, or I'm going to call my sister and talk about nothing. So that avoidance shows up because I'm trying to avoid a specific emotional experience. An impulse is based off of a feeling and not a thought. So when I say that impulsivity leads to procrastination, What I'm actually saying is that procrastination happens when we allow our feelings to make decisions for us instead of just being one of the factors in the decisions that we end up making. Now, don't get me wrong. Our feelings are very important. They inform a lot of things. We need them. I am always going to encourage us to feel our feelings and to consider our feelings, right? But our feelings are also very temporary. They are momentary. And it's not very wise to make decisions based on temporary factors, right? Feelings come and go. They're they're fluid like that. So If you're making especially a long-term or permanent decision based on something that is temporary and fluid, that probably is, is not the wisest, which makes it pretty impulsive. So if you struggle with procrastination, then you probably struggle with impulsivity. And if you struggle with impulsivity, you likely struggle with emotional regulation. So all these things are are related, but this is kind of how we get down to the root of certain things. It's always important to do this work because we want to tell ourselves like, just stop procrastinating, just do the thing. And trust me, if it were that easy, we would just do the thing. But these are the reasons that it's not always just that easy. And so we have to take the time to understand what's at the root of our behavior, What's at the root of the patterns that we're seeing? So once we get to this understanding that at the root of our procrastination may be an issue with emotional regulation, then instead of saying, just stop procrastinating, we can say, let's learn how to regulate our emotions so that we are not impulsive and therefore procrastinating and and pushing off doing important things. Do we see the difference there? Okay. Now, logically, All of that could make sense, right? You can follow the thought process here. But knowing and understanding something logically and intellectually is not always enough to make it click. That's not always enough to make it stick. 
at, at least, at least not for me. And so this is where the whole conversation about feeling motivated comes into play. Part of the reason that we struggle so much with making any change and any lasting change is because we don't always feel motivated to do so. We have this thought or idea that we need to be like in the mood before we do the hard or important work, but we're usually not going to be in the mood to do things that are going to lead to lasting change. Because like we've talked about before, in order to see any sort of lasting change, you have to step outside of your comfort zone. And we're typically not in the mood to do that. So the motivation doesn't always come first before the thing, but that's what we're waiting for sometimes, which is kind of what keeps us stuck. In reality, our motivation comes after we have started doing something more more often than not, because we've done the thing and we want to keep up with that momentum because that feels good. And that's what we're chasing, right? And we feel motivated to keep doing the thing. But have you ever wondered why like the hardest part in doing a new thing is just starting? And we're always waiting for that motivation to come first. But once you finally start, then it's easier to keep going than it is to like start doing something. And I think that that's why we're waiting to be in the mood (laughs) to do something that's going to be maybe hard or something uh, that we're not certain that we're going to be successful at. Like we're not, that motivation isn't just going to going to come, right? Motivation does not always precede action. It's, it's often the other way around. So we, we, we have to really let that settle in our spirit that we can't wait for the motivation before we do the important thing. Starting is always the hardest part because we spend so much time negotiating with our feelings. I was planning to go to the gym this morning, but I really wasn't feeling it. Um, and so maybe I'll just go later today. Instead, I'll just like take my time, um, and wake, you know, get up out of the bed slowly and, you know, maybe I'll make something to eat first and then I'll just get to it later. And then later comes and oh, I've had a long day at work and I'm already kind of stressed and so I don't feel like it. And maybe I'll just, maybe I'll just try and go tomorrow instead. There's this constant negotiation that's happening between uh, our, our wants and needs and our feelings in the moment. But that's the thing is that our feelings are in the moment. And so something that that helps or has helped me is that instead of looking for motivation or to be in the mood for something, I think about purpose instead, right? There is a a bigger purpose and an overall, like an overarching goal maybe that we're wanting to work towards that still remains important and still remains a priority. And sometimes that can be enough to get you started. So I may not feel like going to, to the gym But if I know that I have a goal, whether it be a weight loss goal or just being more healthy physically, especially as I get older, right? The body just ain't what it used to be. So if I have an overall goal of just taking better care of my physical health, then that might be enough encouragement for me to go to the gym, even though I'm not in the mood. That's not going to put me in the mood, but that is going to um, reemphasize the importance of sticking to my commitments that I'm making to myself. So if you can't find motivation in the moment, can you access purpose instead? Purpose typically is is more existential and and it matters more and it's it's bigger, right? We have like a bigger picture and we talk a lot about like legacy and wanting to create something for ourselves. And so if we align our purpose with with that kind of idea, then we don't necessarily need motivation in the moment. We don't necessarily need to feel like in, in the mood, right? For some of us, at least now, of course, like everything, this is personalized and individualized and and everyone is different, but this is one of the things that I have found to be helpful. If I'm not in the mood, then the question becomes, well, has this overall purpose become any less important? If it has not become any less important, then I need to stick to the commitments that I'm making because it's it's still important, right? That I work towards being healthy or that I work towards whatever long-term goals that I have. So if you cannot access motivation in the moment, can you access purpose? This has been a really helpful reframe for me, especially when I realized that self-discipline and self-control, it's a fruit of the spirit. Now, listen, a good way for me to prioritize anything and to stick to the commitments that I'm making is to find a spiritual meaning for it. So putting it in the category of this is a fruit of the spirit in which I'm lacking, that's different from like beating yourself into submission and saying like, just do it, just do the thing, just do the thing. No, no, no. This is a fruit of the spirit. 
which means that if I'm not actively trying to grow in this area, then I am willingly keeping myself at a distance from God. Why would I do that? And so as I am really trying to master self-discipline and self-control, adding that spiritual element, that's what finally made it stick for me. Saying I made a commitment and I should stick to my commitment, that wasn't enough for me. Honestly speaking, that's not always enough for me. I need a deeper meaning to certain things. Just like as I'm trying to understand my own behaviors, I need to get to the root and to the deeper meaning. Listen, I thrive in the deeper meaning of anything. (laughs) That's probably the therapist in me. But that's how I'm able to be successful, is connecting with a deeper meaning for something, connecting with something that is more long lasting. Maybe it's because I understand that that feelings are are temporary. I don't know. Let me not get into the the reason behind that right now. We we don't have time to go on that kind of a tangent. But connecting with a deeper meaning, especially as it relates to self-discipline and self-control, that has helped me to uh commit to finding a way to make it work for me. For years I have really felt very disorganized, um, unproductive, irresponsible, just in in my day-to-day life. And I, I feel like I just am always lacking structure and order and, and organization. And I've tried a lot of different things that I've seen work for other people and I've tried the different planners and but what I have uh, have really learned and accepted and leaned into is that uh, I have to find and create a system that works for me specifically and that works with the way that I think. Now, I, I will go on a quick tangent here um, because there has been um, a, a whole lot of talk lately about this idea of neurodivergence, right? And just the fact that there are Uh, multiple different ways of thinking and and different thought patterns. Now, while I'm I'm, I'm, I'm a bit hesitant to, I don't like throwing out labels and diagnoses very quickly. I think that we do jump the gun with that a little bit. This is like the current mental health fad. And so everyone wants to, um, wants to be on the spectrum and everyone wants to, you know, have ADHD because that's what we're talking about now. And while there probably is some some validity to the fact that we don't all think the same way, I have never subscribed to the fact that there is a right or wrong way of thinking. With that being said, sometimes it can be helpful to have uh, a a diagnosis or to be a, or, or to be able to have some sort of a label because that gives you a better uh, understanding of what you're dealing with. And that can point you in the direction of some specific tools that can help you with your specific thought process. I say all this to say, don't be discouraged if a certain technique doesn't work for you. I've definitely been there where there are some techniques that like don't work for me. Like, why does this work for every everybody else? Or it seems like this works for everybody else, but it, it just doesn't work for me. And that made me feel like a failure or like I'm just not an organized person. And now I'm over identifying with being unorganized, right? And so then I'm definitely not feeling motivated to try to find a system that works for me all because I'm trying to fit into whatever box other people are seemingly fitting into. So if you have struggled with similar things for a long time and you've really um, had a hard time uh, overcoming certain things, especially as it relates to like the the way that you think and understand the world around you, um, don't be discouraged. And maybe that is a good reason to reach out to a professional, right? Maybe that is um, a a good reason to maybe get some sort of an evaluation so that you can have the deeper uh, insight and perspective on yourself. For a lot of people that can be very freeing. Uh, because it really kind of liberates you from this idea that you're wrong or a failure, that you can't even think right, that you can't even like organize your life right. So I'm not saying hurry up, go out and get a diagnosis. But I am saying lean into the fact that uh, it's okay if what works for other people doesn't work for you. It's okay uh, if you need different things in your environment in order to be successful. Um, And it's okay if you reach out for help for someone who can point you in the direction of some of the things that you can include in your environment to help you be successful. Okay. That's your therapy plug for the day.
But ultimately, self-discipline, self-control, they're not monolithic. It looks it looks different for everyone, right? We all have different experiences and different things uh, that affect the way that we approach our life uh, and affect the way that we're able to function in different aspects. When it comes to maintaining a, a, a sense of structure or order in my life, I know that some of the general things that work for other people, they just don't work for me. Writing things down, it don't really work for me because I'm going to walk away from that list that I wrote down. And I really have a problem with like out of sight, out of mind. I have a problem with with object permanence sometimes. In my bathroom, I I don't have a, um, there's not like a, a medicine cabinet that's convenient for me. So instead I put up some shelves by my sink for all my skincare. I have never been so consistent with my skincare because I'm looking at right at it. It's not inside of a cabinet. I don't have to open it up to see it. So for me, I need to be able to see things. So writing something down is not going to help unless I'm unless that list is somewhere that I I'm I know I'm going to look at it. But I move around throughout the day. So like what if I move away from that list? So that don't really help me, right? Um having an accountability partner hasn't really been helpful for me. Uh in some ways I guess maybe it has, but I don't think it's been as helpful for me as it has been for other people because then I I fixate on uh, making sure that my accountability partner is not disappointed in me and I don't leave myself enough uh, room for flexibility to adjust for for what I need, right? Having an accountability partner really triggers my people pleasing, so I don't think that it works for me. Giving myself or offering myself incentives doesn't really work for me. So like saying at the end of the week, if I... um have folded all of my clothes by the end of the week, then I don't know, I'll get myself a new purse. That doesn't work for me because if I really want something for myself, I'm just going to get it. I'm just going to get it. And I'm probably going to forget about that purse by the end of the week anyway. So those things don't, they don't work for me. There are some things that I found that do work for me. For me, if I have to do a daunting task, like say my taxes, I have to set the vibe. So like I have um, like color changing lights in pretty much every room in my house. And if I'm doing something that I know stresses me out and that I want to avoid, I set the vibe. I'm putting on some softer lighting. I'm probably putting on like purple or blue lighting, right? I have like, (laughs) I have some emotional support items that I put on. I have an emotional support hoodie. I have some like emotional support glasses that I put on when I need to like lock in and do something important. That helps for me. I need to take sensory breaks. Um, I have like little fidget things on my desk all the time. And like I said earlier, like finding a spiritual meaning to something, those are the things that help me to stay consistent and focused and motivated. Those things may or may not be consistent with a diagnosis or another, but regardless, I need to find what works for me. At the end of the day, it doesn't have to work for anybody else but me. So for years, I felt like I just could not be a disciplined person, just could not be a structured or organized person. But I'm recently leaning into the fact that um, I have the liberty to decide what organization means to me, what structure means to me. I have to break things down into like bite-sized tasks and I need to like give myself credit for every single part of the task that I do. I'm telling y'all, I be getting overwhelmed, okay? (laughs) I be getting overwhelmed and like just walking away from things, but I, I can't, I can't do that. And that has really presented as a as a challenge for me, as a struggle for me in some areas. And what I recognize is walking away from certain things um, and not being disciplined enough to um, do the hard thing or to like find a way to uh, sustain through the hard thing that is taking me outside of my purpose, that is taking me outside of God's will for my life. Putting it in that terminology, that connects me to the purpose, which means that even if I'm not in the mood, if I ask myself, is it important that I grow in this area to look more like Christ and to be more pleasing to God? The answer is always going to be yes. So, okay, girl, take your time and do it. Do it slowly if you need. Go put on your hoodie. Go put on your glasses. Put on some, some soft music in the background. Get a cute little snack. Do what you have to do. But do what you have to do in order to endure, in order to get through it. Find what works for you. Like, Don't be afraid of a little trial and error. Like, That's really the only way to find it. We're, we're really, we don't like the trial and error process. We just want to get it right. We just want to get it right the first time. I don't know anybody who gets things right the first time. 
So accept the fact that in order to find what works for you, you're probably going to have to go through several things that don't work for you first. And that's okay. That's part of the process. Because when you do find what works for you, it's going to keep working for you. And that's a great feeling. Okay, so let's talk about self-control as a fruit of the spirit. When I think about fruits of the spirit, I think about godly characteristics that are produced in us that make us look more like Christ. Now, if you are familiar at all with Jesus's time here on earth, then you know that he exercised a great amount of self-control and a great amount of self-discipline. That man did not want to get up on that cross, okay? But he did. I know he didn't want to get on that cross. He was not in the mood. (laughs) He was not in the mood to get on the cross, but he understood the purpose and he still believed in the bigger purpose, in the bigger purpose, which is why he did it. Folks try Jesus all the time. They tried him all the time, but he stuck to uh, his morals, to his commitments, to what he knew was important. So think about an area in your life where you might be lacking in self-control. If we can start thinking about any area that we lack in self-control as an area where there is room to invite God to encounter us there, I think that would be really helpful. At least for me, it's been really helpful. So wherever you're lacking really in any fruit of the spirit, that's a way to invite God into your life in a new way. And I know as Christians, we're always wanting to hear from God more and to like feel his presence more. And this is a good way to do it. Be honest with some of your blind spots or with some of the areas that you're lacking. That's a perfect opportunity to get to know God even more in a new way, in a way that maybe you haven't been familiar with him before. Inviting God into some of my like mental and emotional struggles has been so, so, so impactful in my relationship with him. It has really strengthened and deepened the level of intimacy that I feel with him because I am, and you know, I say inviting God into these spaces like he's not already there. It might just be a matter of acknowledging his presence in those spaces, acknowledging that he can meet you in those spaces. I think back to uh, my my way of thinking before, and it was really kind of naive to think that there were any spaces in my life where God was not already there or where he could not meet me there, where he could not meet those needs. But especially when it comes to the fruits of the spirit, which are things that uh, we ought to be wanting and, and uh, actively working towards producing, especially when it comes to those things, we cannot grow in those areas without God, without his spirit. Whose spirit do you think we're talking about when we say fruits of the spirit? Fruits of his spirit, fruits of the Holy Spirit. So there is no way, there is no way for me to successfully produce self-control or self-discipline without God. And that's the same for any fruit of the spirit. There's no way for me to be patient without God. There's no way for me to be loving without God. There's no way for me to be long-suffering without God. And so that is, just tells me, okay, this is an area where my faith can be the tool that I use to grow. And that makes me feel really good because I know that my that if my faith is growing and getting stronger, I'm going to be successful in this area. Like that takes away a lot of my anxiety. And by removing the anxiety, it, it gives me the room to walk through some more trial and error. It gives me the flexibility to come back to the plan and say, okay, this part is working, but this part isn't working, right? It really relieves me of the perfectionism that I tend to expect of myself when I lean on my faith instead, right? Because I think with the perfectionism, I feel like if I if I ease up at all, I don't trust myself to ever come back to this thing. If I ease up at all, then I feel like it's probably just a cop out, right? But if I'm allowing my faith to carry me through it, then It's not an easing up. It is a reassessment. And that's very important for us to do with any kind of growth, right? Everything that is happening around us and everything that is surrounding any type of growth that we're trying to see is just data. It's information. So if I'm trying to implement a certain certain system, if I'm trying to implement these certain tools to help me to stay motivated and, and, and disciplined, then we have to go through, it's it's like a research phase. You have to go through like testing, right? Okay, let me try this thing, see how it works. And everything is just information. It's, it's data gathering at that point. You need a certain amount of data in order to be able to make the most informed decision. So if we think about it that way, give yourself the room and the flexibility to, to, to 
embrace the trial and error because every error is just information about maybe what doesn't work. And everything that you find that doesn't work, it gets you one step closer to what does work for you. To me, this is a, a really beautiful thought and approach that uh, my faith is the, the vehicle and the tool uh, in which it's going to help me grow in this area that is going to benefit my mental and emotional health. It's just another way of really partnering with God and walking with him hand in hand instead of trying to do it on your own and then bringing it and presenting it to God. Like here, God, is it good enough? What do you think? But he's, he's, he's already in it. So it's also made it, um, it, it's removed a lot of the shame. I think when I do identify a weak spot that I might have, I'm grateful that God has revealed it to me. And I'm grateful that now this is another opportunity for me to spend more time with him, for me to know him more, for me to be closer to him. So instead of feeling shame and guilt, when I see a weak spot, it's almost like a, it's, it's a gift. I'm like, oh my gosh, great. So now this is even more time that I get to spend with God. And the more that you like really dive into your relationship with him, like the relational aspect, the relational element, like think about people in your life that you just love and are obsessed with and you want to spend as much time with them as possible. You will take any excuse, any reason to spend time with them. But I don't think we always do the same with God, but there are so many opportunities, so many opportunities and, and reason, significant reasons that we get to spend more time with God, that we get to encounter him in new ways, that we get to learn more about him. And there's really no downside to that. So I really like that perspective of uh, inviting God into the into my my weak spots instead of trying to hide them from him until I feel like they are presentable enough to show him, you know? We have to be willing to allow God to enter into the spaces where where we're lacking spiritually because we need his spirit in order to develop in all these ways. We cannot develop the fruits of the spirit without the spirit. How does that work? It doesn't. Understand that the Holy Spirit can handle your dysfunction. The Holy Spirit can handle your maladaptive thoughts, right? You are not too messed up for God. Let that sink in. You're not too messed up for him. You're not too damaged for God. Okay. There is no amount of damage, of trauma, of pain, of abuse that is too much for God that he cannot handle. Right. He probably is the only one who can handle a lot of it. But I think that's a part of the reason that we don't uh, involve God in certain aspects of our life because we feel like we're we're too damaged or we're too much or we're too much of a burden, right? This is another way that we we project some of the tenets of our relationships with other people onto our relationship with God. We do feel that way in relationships with other people sometimes like we're too much, we're too damaged, we're too traumatized, we're a burden. We feel that way a lot with other people, but you are never a burden for God. Ever. That applies to everything, right? Whether we're talking about trying to grow in a specific fruit of the spirit or anything else, you're never too much for God, okay? Someone needs to hear that today. You're you're not too much for God. You're never too much for God. But the Holy Spirit can handle our dysfunction in ways that we cannot. When we are lacking in the fruits of the spirit, we're being controlled by the flesh. Now, we know that there is always this constant battle between the flesh and the spirit, flesh and the spirit. But when we lack self-control, especially... We are having a hard time controlling our flesh. When we lack self-control, we're allowing ourselves to be controlled by our flesh. But the word says that we are to deny our flesh and die to self every single day. But that constant battle is because the lust of the flesh is one of the one of the three categories of sin. And that is a really big one. When we lack self-control, it's because the lust of the flesh, right? Those instant gratification moments, those temporary feelings, those are the things that are making our decisions for us. Those are the things that are in the driver's seat instead of something that's just in the back seat and that's coming with us. But those are the things that are making the decisions for us. So if we are to be denying our flesh, 
right? And turning away from the lust of the flesh. And that means that we're turning to the spirit instead. We cannot defeat sin without the spirit. It simply cannot be done. So what space in your heart and mind do you need to invite God into? Or what space in your heart and mind do you need to acknowledge God's presence in? What space in your heart and mind do you need to spend some more time with God in? Is it in your slowfulness? Is it in your pride? Is it in your gluttony? Is it in your lack of love? Think about where you resemble Christ the least and let God encounter you there so that he can develop those fruits of the spirit and help you to look more like him. Okay, um, let's get into our scripture for the day. See what the word has to say about some of this. Today's scripture comes from Proverbs 13 and 4. It's a short one, but it's a heavy hitter. It says the soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. It's not enough just to want something for yourself. In a previous episode, uh, we talked about seasons of stagnation and how sometimes in those seasons we have a lot of vision, but no action, right? Vision with no action is not going to get you anywhere. Faith without works is dead. And so even though there might be a lot of things keeping us in our stagnation and contributing to those seasons, God calls us to be diligent in working through those things and not allowing those things to keep us paralyzed and to stop us from acting on those desires. Remember that if you stay close to God, then he's going to uh, give you the desires of your heart or he's going to place the desires on your heart that are pleasing to him. So if you have these desires... You want these things for yourself, but you're not acting on them. You're not being diligent or self-disciplined enough to act on these desires that God has placed in you, then he's not pleased with that. If God placed these desires on your heart and you're not doing anything with them, then you're being disobedient. Maybe framing it that way can help us to really start taking some actionable steps towards the things that we want, or maybe framing it that way can help us uh, to endure through the trial and error process to figure out how to make those desires actually come to fruition. But God says that we're lazy if we're not acting on those desires on our heart. Now, I know lazy is a, that that's a buzzword, right? And that, that's a trigger word a lot. And usually when we think about lazy, we think about like not just not wanting to do anything, not wanting to be in the mood. But if you, if there's a desire that's on your heart, if there's a desire that God has placed on your heart, and you are not being diligent enough to find the self-control or the discipline to see it come to fruition, then God says that's also lazy. And that's what he calls a sluggard. Sluggard, that is a word. That's a, that, that's, that's really one of them old school insults that we might need to bring back. Like it's giving sluggard. <laughs> But know that no matter how hard it might be to see those desires uh, come to fruition, they wouldn't be on your heart. They would not be on your mind if God didn't want them to be actualized through you. That's his plan. That's his purpose. That's his will. We don't want to get in the way of that. Even if getting in the way of that means not doing anything with the desire, right? Right. Sometimes getting in the way can be very passive, right? Inaction can also get in the way of that. And it's slowing down the will of God. We don't want to do that. I know I don't want to do that. And generally speaking, it's unwise to have a a plan or a, a vision with no action. And it's not going to help you look more like Christ. The enemy does not want you to act on the desires that God has placed on your heart. So there will always be things that make it hard to do it. There's always going to be roadblocks. There's always going to be barriers. I don't think it's ever really going to be a straight shot. (laughs) I don't think it's ever going to be a straight shot. We have to anticipate that, right? Um, But even when it's not a straight shot, does that take away from the purpose? If it doesn't, then you have an obligation and a responsibility to walk in obedience and to ask God to help you produce the fruit of the spirit that you need in order to see these desires come to fruition. So if if this is you, like it was definitely me, ask yourself, what are some of the barriers 
in general, I really don't like using the the term lazy because it, it just implies that like you don't care and you don't want any better for yourself. But this verse says that a lazy person has desires and doesn't do anything with it. So ask yourself, is there something keeping you from putting forth the effort? What are the things that are keeping you from putting forth the effort that's going to be necessary? I don't believe that you just don't care. There's something that's stopping you. There's something that's keeping you stuck. There's a barrier that is keeping you paralyzed that um, is is making it difficult for you to access the level of discipline or self-control that's necessary to bring this thing to life. What is it? And is it worth your disobedience to God? For me, the answer is no. It's not worth my disobedience to God. It is worth me being uncomfortable enough to work through it and to overcome it and to have a mastery over these things that are presenting as barriers in my life. For me, it's worth it. So you have to answer that question for yourself. I can't answer that for you. Nobody else can answer it for you. There's something that's stopping you from diligently putting forth effort to bring this desire to life. So what is stopping you from giving that thing to God so that he can deliver you from it and see his will actualized through you? You're the only person who can do it. That's why he put the desire on your heart. So what is that thing? And when are you going to give it to God? Okay. All right. Um, That brings us to our question of the day. Just as a quick reminder, if you have a question that you want to be answered on the show, you can send me an email at therapyandprayer at gmail.com or leave it in the comments wherever you're watching or listening to this. Okay. um, Today's question, how do you stay in the moment and self-regulate as emotions come? This is something that comes up a lot um, because we have an issue with impulsivity, uh, especially when emotions are high and we're in high stress situations, then uh, our feelings get to be so overwhelming that they start to make decisions for us. So it is an important skill to be able to regulate in the moment and acknowledge your feelings as they come without being controlled by your feelings when they enter the picture. But the, the the bottom line and essentially the answer here is that the more familiar you become with your emotions, the easier it becomes uh, to know what you need and the easier it is to regulate them. I've, I've spoken about mindfulness uh, before um, and it is really helpful in moments of anxiety. And this is a part of the reason why, but practicing mindfulness on a regular basis is going to be uh, really essential in helping you to uh, recognize and identify your emotions as they're coming up. Uh, something that I often encourage people to do uh, because we have to practice these tools, right? We have to practice them when we don't need them so that when we do need them, they're easier to recall. So something that I encourage folks to do is uh, set a few alarms throughout your day for some mindfulness breaks. What that means is that you take two to three minutes, you check in with yourself, with, with your mind and with your body, see if you're feeling any tension anywhere in your body? Are you feeling any heaviness anywhere in your body? See if you can identify where it's coming from uh, and then engage at least one of your five senses, right? Uh, To help you kind of move through the tension and the heaviness or to release some of the tension and the heaviness. Go have a snack. Stand outside for a couple of minutes and, and take some some deep breaths, right? Um, engage any of, of those five senses, but take a moment, check in with yourself so that you can start to become more familiar with uh, with what you're feeling, but also just so that you can get into the habit uh, of familiarizing yourself with the ups and downs of, of your own uh, emotional experience. That's going to make it easier for you to tell when you're starting to become dysregulated. We want to get to the point where we can see a certain emotional experience coming before it's already here. We want to be able to say, "Mm, I am starting to feel a bit tense in my shoulders. And so maybe that means I'm starting to get a little bit irritated. uh, And if I don't do something about this now, I'm probably going to get really mad and I'm probably going to go off on somebody. We want to be able to recognize the warning signs before it gets to the point where we're in like a crisis control. Right. So practicing mindfulness is really helpful in that because then you can start to feel when there's a shift in you emotionally. And that's the perfect time to pause, use one of your coping skills, use one of your regulation tools, go outside and take some deep breaths. That's a perfect time uh, to check in with yourself and to give yourself what you need. If what you need in that moment is to walk away, then you walk away. If what you need in that moment is 
to go get some water, then go get some water. If what you need in that moment is to do something with your hands, do something with your hands. Not violence, but do something with your hands. If what you need in that moment is to vent with a friend, then call someone who's safe enough for you to vent to. Uh, But we have to become much more familiar with our own uh, emotional experience so that we can know how and when to intervene instead of going to one of those defense mechanisms, catastrophizing, numbing, uh, avoiding, suppressing, which means that we're just like pushing those feelings down. Cause we all know what happens when we just push feelings down and we just keep layering them on top of each other. Eventually they're going to come out in not the healthiest of ways. And we don't want to do that. So short answer, get more familiar with your emotions so that you can uh, be more in control of them in the moment. All right. That's all I got for y'all today. Um, I hope that it was helpful as always. Thank you for listening. I love you so much and I will talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to this episode of Therapy and Prayer. Make sure you're subscribed and following wherever you listen to podcasts. And if the spirit moves you, go ahead and leave us a review. If you want to submit a question to be answered on this show, send us an email at therapyandprayer at gmail.com and make sure you're following us on TikTok at Therapy and Prayer. Thanks again for listening. I'll talk to you soon.